It's time once again for a musical offering with program director David Dubal, the complete works of Chopin. And now we are discussing the impromptus. No, we're going to have all the complete works tonight, every one of them. What did you say? We're going to play all 169 works tonight and get this series out of the way. We concluded yesterday's program with the breezy A-flat impromptu. Chopin wrote four impromptus. They've become popular because I think they're of medium difficulty, at least one in four, although they certainly have difficulties to project the uh, spontaneity necessary. We left with the A-flat, one of my favorites. We will begin tonight with the only impromptu, which is not very impromptu, and perhaps for that reason it is musically the greatest of the four. It's an F-sharp major. It's Opus 36, and it was published in 1840, Chopin being 30 years old. The pianist in this case will be the Russian or Soviet pianist, Bela Davidovich.
Soviet artist Bela Davidovich, and I much admire her Scriabin playing. She was once supposed to come to America, but that did not happen. She has a recording of all four impromptus on Russia's single label, Melodia. It was a performance that had many elegant moments. Very difficult work because on one hearing it seems rather formless. Perhaps that part of it is the title impromptu. Where did Chopin get the title impromptu? Well, Schubert had written impromptus and a few other early Romantic composers. It was an ideal title for Chopin, who did not like to be too literary. Simple structure, as many of Chopin's works are, but filled with great details and always full of inspiration. This can be a great work of art, almost like a ballade. It's not like the A-flat or the fantasy impromptu. We have another performance by the great Alfred Cortot.
Alfred Cortot in the F-sharp major impromptu of Frédéric Chopin. And we will return with the G-flat impromptu in one minute. Great opera at sensible prices means the New York City Opera. Tickets are still available for performances this week, including Salome with Marilyn Niska and Francis Bible tomorrow night at 8, and the HMS Pinafore on Sunday afternoon at 1. Tickets are at the New York State Theatre box office in Lincoln Center, Bloomingdale's, and ANS, or you can charge by phone with major credit cards. Simply call Charge It, 239-7177. That's 239-7177 for Great Opera, the New York City Opera. In the four years uh, that um, placed the G-flat impromptu from the second, from 1838 when it was actually composed, the second impromptu, to 1842, Chopin was in his most productive stages. His relationship with George Sand was flourishing. He was taken away each summer to compose at her country estate. He had been tired from a tremendous season of socializing, playing, being a popular idol, and teaching sometimes ten lessons a day at exorbitant prices comparable to around $40 a lesson in our own money. He spent every penny of it, but they were amazingly productive years, these four years which separate the second impromptu, opus 36 to opus 51, the third impromptu, marked Allegro Vivace, it's in G-flat major, and was dedicated to the Countess Esterhazy. It's not nearly as well known as number one, two, or four, yet it's a fascinating work. Chopin himself did not care for it. We have a performance, fairly recent performance, by the American-born pianist who lives, I believe, in London. He had studied with Dame Myra Hess, and his name is Stephen Bishop.
though not a favorite piece of Chopin's himself. Wonderful freedom of modulation and great complexity of pattern written in thirds and sixths. Very fine performance by Stephen Bishop. We now hear a performance by Alfred Cortot of the Impromptu, Opus 51, in G-flat.
Courtois achieves miraculously all the delicacy of design in this work which has an element of strangeness in it. And what a sound in the E-flat minor trio with that cello-like melody in the left hand. Seldom do we get Chopin playing like this. And of course, this piece not being well known, I would like very much to hear Corto's performance once again.
Alfred Cortot finding all the proper morbideza within this beautiful work in impromptu in G flat. And we will ba be back with the most famous of the four impromptus, the fantasy impromptu. If you're heading for California, United's going your way with seven daily nonstops, including our roomy 747 and DC-10s. Just sit back, relax, and get the kinks out. Then get ready for some delicious decisions. United lets you choose from a light bite, a full meal, or one of our famous bicentennial entrees. So come join us in the friendly skies of United, offering more flights to more California cities more often. Take care along the way, make you feel at home. Welcoming you in friendship to the land you call your own. The friendly skies of your land. Going to California in style. That's Friendship Service. United Airlines. United offers Friendship Service to California ten times every day. That includes five wide-body flights. And we are back with the Fantasy Impromptu. I am always chasing rainbows. The middle section was made into a popular song. It has totally ruined it for me, of course. But I do my best. I adore the opening section and the closing in this ABA form, in this Bellini-like coloratura with four notes moving quickly against three in the left hand, making a magnificent texture. There's a certain hysteria in it, at least in the performances that I like. Um, it's Opus 66, and it was published posthumously in 1855. Chopin died in 1849 composed in 1834. Why did he not let it be published? Absolutely much first-rate Chopin is in it. Perhaps it was that middle section which lacks a certain distinction. It can uh, be awfully mawkish in certain hands. Um, often people that have made this work hackneyed turn the quick opening into something slower than they can play and the middle just too sentimental and yet in a fine performance it's a highly effective work and certainly deserves its popularity although i wish that popular song had not been written here we have the hungarian pianist Tomasz Vasari.
a technically beautiful performance by Vachery, also very sensitive. All parts were working. Well, I am curious to hear Claudio Arau, who is not my favorite Chopin player, but many people love all of his playing. And we have a performance of the Fantasy Impromptu by Claudio Arau.
Well, there are no rules with great pianists. Yesterday we heard a row, and I thought a miserable performance of the A-flat impromptu. Here he comes back with one that has certain things that I would think miserable, but other things just wonderful. He certainly wouldn't let the, uh, the middle section become sentimental. Yet again, as I'm always curious with the timings on a Rao's work, almost one minute longer than Vasheri's performance, which we heard previously. Well, now I am curious to hear what Alfred Corteau does with the fantasy impromptu.
Well, I'm shocked. Alfred Cortot, who has been charming me, has not come through, and I don't think we can uh, conclude the impromptus on that note, which Cortot was just not coming off at all in this impromptu. Forget the technical shoddiness. It was, it was just disjointed. It, it had n uh, no direction at all. Um, so interesting to hear different performances. Let's have one more to conclude the Chopin impromptus, and we hear the American-born pianist Ivan Davis in a new all-Chopin release, The Fantasy Impromptu.
Oh, Ivan Davis playing technically superb and with some interesting ideas in the left hand, although musically, well, I'm not sure. I'll have to hear that again. But uh, it, it lacked that, that romanticism that the work so possesses. Well, perhaps he was trying to clean up that romanticism. Well, we have ended the impromptus, and our next program will deal with Chopin's heart and soul, the Polonaise. When you think of French haute cuisine and the outstanding delicacy of the Gallic hosting, La Petite Marmite is the place. While Gérard Rouet, owner chef, prepares the renowned La Petite Marmite house specialties, Jacques Ruet, your host and co-owner, will show you to the elegant and distinguished dining room. La Petite Marmite received three stars from the New York Times Guide for its exquisite French dishes, such as Grenouille Provençal, Pigeon aux Olives, and more. But the only one judge can be your own palate. La Petite Marmite is located at the elegant east side of Manhattan, near the United Nations. So while dining, you can enjoy our international pleasant atmosphere. Our wine cellar contains a wide selection of wines to suit any taste. Go French tonight. Come to La Petite Marmite, 49th Street and 1st Avenue, at the Bigman Tower. For reservation, call 826-1084. That's 826-1084. For the real gourmet, La Petite Marmite. Join us again Monday evening for another musical offering with program director David Dubow, where we will continue with the 16 Polonaises next week. <laughs>